Highlights of today's Premiership action to come in Match of the Day. That's after the news now on BBC One with Darren Jordan. Tony Blair is accused of a sellout after securing a deal on the EU budget. He accepts cuts in Britain's rebate. Opponents say he's won little in return. Violence at the World Trade Talks as protesters battle with police. And stolen on the back of a lorry, thieves make off with a massive Henry Moore sculpture. Good evening. Tony Blair's deal on the European Union budget has come under political fire tonight after Britain gave up part of its annual rebate. But after months of wrangling and a night of intense negotiations, the new agreement will lead to a review of France's farming subsidies. The deal will see Britain and the EU paying more to new member states. There will be a £1 billion cut in the UK's annual rebate. That means overall Britain will contribute £42 billion over seven years. That's an increase of 63%. From Brussels, our Europe editor Mark Mardell reports. Christmas shopping in Brussels Grand Place. And now the European Union can get down to spending its money too. Most of the goodies go to the new countries of Eastern Europe. And Mr Blair says it's for them that he's done a deal. He's tough and courageous, according to other European leaders, but at home different words were used, like humiliation and surrender. If we had simply said we were not going to do this deal, we would have done immense damage. Not just to the European Union, we'd have done an awful lot of damage to our relationship with those new countries, and that relationship is in Britain's national interest. But what about that rebate? He said it only given up a bit to help the East. We not just kept the rebate, in full on all other spending, but it will actually increase over the period of the next financial perspective. Britain's not the only one paying more. Italy's Silvio Berlusconi is taking a big hit. And President Chirac's also seeing his contributions shoot up. Still, he got what he wanted. Tony Blair has accepted a serious change in the British rebate. It's politically difficult for him, and it is a big gesture. The French can afford warm words and wide smiles. They feel they've given no ground on farming subsidies. Tony Blair did start off wanting either real changes or firm promises. He got neither and headed off home to face criticisms. In the general election, which is only seven months ago, they said the rebate was non-negotiable and fully justified. That's what the voters were told. They then said, not unreasonably, well, we'll trade a bit of that in return for CAP reform. Now they've abandoned even that. I think this is a profoundly disappointing end to a presidency which promised so much. The government has failed to achieve its objective, which was to bring about radical reform of the common agricultural policy. But no criticisms from the polls. They're normally do a prime minister enthused that the taste of victory was as good as the finest champagne. His country held out for and got a lot of the money. For Germany's new leader, a snatched bottle of water was enough. She's quickly established herself as a shrewd peacemaker. But Germany, like other rich countries, ended up paying more than they really wanted to. The sculpture outside the building where they've been meeting is called Onwards Europe. But the leaders aren't very much further forwards on whether they should spend their money on farming or on enterprise. They've put off that row for a couple of years yet. Mark Mardell, BBC News, Brussels. Riot police have fought running battles with protesters at the World Trade Talks in Hong Kong. Demonstrators armed with sticks were driven back after they attacked police lines. It came as some of the world's poorest countries threatened to abandon the talks. From Hong Kong, Evan Davis reports. <laughs> Demonstrators trying to break police lines. There have been skirmishes and scuffles all week, but nothing as close to the actual trade talks as this. It's Koreans who dominate the demonstrations, particularly farmers, angry at the way free trade undermines their livelihood. They're getting heard, they're getting quite a name for themselves at these events, but so far at least they're not getting into the building. The police have been relatively restrained. And the public, many came out to watch. If you have family or friends in the area, contact them and tell them to immediately leave because police will be taking all necessary action to restore order. 
It looked at one point as though demonstrators might break into the talks, but in fact, the best views people inside had was on television. But that didn't stop the painfully detailed trade discussions. They even achieved something. There is now a draft declaration for this summit. Alas, the countries here haven't all signed up to it yet, and the earlier ambitions have been watered down. It's been a week of standoffs in the trade talks, and they've only one day left to resolve them. And back outside the talks tonight, there was a standoff of another kind, police facing demonstrators. Whether it's trade protests or the trade talks, diplomatic skills are very much in demand. Evan Davis, BBC News, Hong Kong. Here, a couple and their three children have died in a fire at their home in Middlesex. It broke out in the early hours of the morning. The parents, along with their two daughters and a son, all under 10 years old, were found by firefighters at the house in Hayes. Investigators believe the fire may have been started by Christmas lights. Unionist politicians in Northern Ireland have called for a public inquiry after a senior Sinn Féin official admitted spying for Britain for 20 years. Dennis Donaldson is one of three men cleared last week on charges relating to an alleged IRA spy ring at Stormont. A huge bronze sculpture by the artist Henry Moore, worth around £3 million, has been stolen from the grounds of a museum in Hertfordshire. Police fear the work, called a reclining figure, could be sold for scrap, despite weighing more than two tonnes. Here's Daniel Bircher. This is the sculpture that was stolen, called Reclining Figure 1969-70, valued at around £3 million, a significant piece in the collection of the Henry Moore Foundation. It would normally have been exhibited here alongside these pieces in the grounds, but as part of routine maintenance, it had been moved. Instead, it was in this yard. Today, only the wooden supports remain. I mean, it could be one of two things from our point of view. It could either be uh, stolen for scrap metal value or it could be uh, fine art theft. And we're looking at all the alternatives in between. These CCTV stills show part of what happened. The sculpture is at the top of the image. A vehicle approaches. After the thieves attached straps to the bronze, a second vehicle, a flatbed truck with a lifting crane, takes it away. The sculpture that was stolen was similar in size to this one, two and a half tonnes of hollow cast bronze, which gives a sense of just how difficult it would have been to hoist it onto the back of a truck in pitch darkness. The process of that, uh... For now, all that is left is a photographic record of how the bronze was made here at Henry Moore's studio in Hertfordshire. For the foundation, this is a great loss. I was completely devastated when I heard it. Well, first of all, it was disbelief, uh, because I couldn't think, couldn't believe that um, something of this size, this weight, could have been taken. And the place is packed with pictures and sculpture. Perry Green was where Henry Moore lived and worked for almost half a century until his death in 1986. The thought that one of his sculptures could be melted down for scrap horrifies those who knew him. I should be very sad and it would be a desecration of a beautiful work of art, uh, vandalism of, of the first category. The Henry Moore Foundation is offering a substantial reward for the return of the sculpture. Daniel Bircher, BBC News, Hertfordshire. President Bush has confirmed that he authorised his security agencies to eavesdrop on private phone calls in America following the September the 11th attacks. Mr Bush defended the practice, saying it was needed to protect national security and save lives. And the former U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, has spoken openly about disagreements within the Bush administration over Iraq. In an interview for the BBC, Mr. Powell also said he was disappointed with the intelligence presented to him before the war. From Washington, James Kumrasamy reports. As America's top diplomat during President Bush's first term in office, Colin Powell was often the face of the nation. And so it was he who made the presentation at the United Nations in early 2003, which argued the case for military action against Iraq. Now, in a BBC interview, Colin Powell says he was never told that some of the intelligence he'd used to make his argument was known at the time to be wrong. I was deeply disappointed uh, in what the intelligence community uh, had presented to me and to the rest of us. And what really upset me more than anything else was that there were people in the intelligence community that had doubts about some of the sourcing, but those doubts never surfaced up to us. He speaks about the arguments he had over post-war policy in Iraq with senior colleagues and addresses an issue which dogged his successor Condoleezza Rice on her recent trip to Europe, the practice of removing terrorist suspects across borders for interrogation, known as rendition. Colin Powell acknowledges this is damaging America's image abroad but accuses its European allies of hypocrisy. Our moral position has been 
weakened as a result of Abu Ghraib and, and uh, what people think about Guantanamo, and then this whole rendition issue came along. Um, is, there's a little bit of uh, uh, the movie Casablanca in this, where uh, you know the inspector says, "I'm shocked, shocked that this kind of thing takes place." Well, most of my European friends cannot be shocked that this kind of thing takes place. And so from Colin Powell, a defense of US policy, but a recognition that this country's moral authority is on the line at a time when the White House is having to defend itself against accusations of condoning torture and illegally snooping on American citizens. James Kimarasamy, BBC News, Washington. And you can see the whole of David Frost's interview with Colin Powell tomorrow afternoon at half past two on BBC News 24. Business leaders and residents near the Buntsfield Oil Depot in Hertfordshire have told the Deputy Prime Minister that the facility should not be rebuilt. John Prescott visited the site this morning to see the devastation caused by last week's explosions. Here's John Brain. Until 6 o'clock on Sunday morning, this was Fuji Films factory in Hemel Hempstead. 140 people were employed here. If the explosion had been during working hours, it's unlikely many of them would have survived. There was uh, some sort of backdraft as everything got sucked out of the building across the, across the car park. Today, the managing director returned to show me just how close the company was to the oil depot, a depot which he says should not be rebuilt. I seen my office, it was totally obliterated and I may have been vaporised had I been there. It's just inconceivable that we would uh, re-establish our company so close to such a, a huge uh, risk. It's a risk many other firms are also reluctant to take. After last week's explosion, they're threatening to leave the industrial estate if the depot is reopened. It was like the nuclear site in Russia, wasn't it? At a meeting with business owners and residents, the Deputy Prime Minister pledged that the future of the depot will now be reviewed. To come and see it in the full daylight, see the scale of the damage, it's well understandable why perhaps companies and uh, indeed residents have been saying to me, is it safe to uh, live and work alongside them? That is a fundamental question which we'll have to address ourselves too. It will take months to repair the damage here and cost millions. But businesses say it won't be worth it if the oil depot is once again allowed to threaten their lives and their livelihoods. John Brain, BBC News, Hemel Hempstead. Now with a roundup of the football results in England and Scotland and the rest of the sport, here's Chris Hollins. Chris? Thanks very much, Darren. Good evening. Now, don't forget, Match of the Day follows this programme where you can see all of today's action from the Premiership. So, if you don't want to know the scores, this is the time to turn the volume down on the television and look away from the screen. The Portsmouth manager, Harry Redknapp, celebrated his return to Fratton Park with a 1-0 win over West Brom. That was their first home victory of the season. Wayne Rooney and Ruud van Nistelrooy scored for Manchester United as they won at Aston Villa 2-0. And Michael Owen scored his first Newcastle hat-trick as they defeated West Ham 4-2 at Upton Park. In the other games, Stelios Janakopoulos scored twice for Bolton as they thrashed Everton 4-0. Fulham won 2-1 against Blackburn. Manchester City beat Birmingham City 4-1. And Wigan returned to winning ways thanks to a hat-trick from Henri Camera. So United's win puts them just six points behind Chelsea. The leaders play Arsenal tomorrow. Liverpool and Tot uh, Tottenham didn't play today. Bolton are in fifth and Wigan are up to sixth. At the bottom, Sunderland had a day off. Portsmouth move above Birmingham and are now just three points behind West Brom. In the Scottish Premier League, Rangers recorded their second successive league win to put their season back on track. They beat title contenders Hearts 1-0. Peter Lovenkrantz scored the only goal of that game. Elsewhere, Kilmarnock won 2-1 at Falkirk. Hibbs kept in touch with the leaders with a 2-1 win against Motherwell. Derek Ryden scored a last-minute winner there. And Livingston drew with Aberdeen. So Celtic are still top and could extend their lead tomorrow when they play Inverness, Caledonian Thistle. Hearts stay second and Hibs are in third. Rangers are fourth but are still some 14 points off the lead. At the bottom, Dunfermline's match was postponed so Livingston have opened up a three-point gap after their draw. Now, there was plenty to play for in Rugby Union's Heineken Cup this afternoon, with the pool stages reaching their conclusion. The biggest game of the day was Saracens against Ulster, and the English club won it 18-10. Here's Joe Wilson. And as a to Steve There's no better spectacle than a bit of a grudge match. After losing to Ulster last weekend, Saracens promised to smash them this time. Ben Skirving said about that task within the rules, scoring with practically the first attack. 
But Ulster responded immediately, keeping the ball alive for winger Tommy Bow to go over. Now, a bit of needle frequently found on living room floors right now was in evidence here. Saracen's prop Kevin Yates sent to the sin bin for his loose fist. Now, 17 and a half stone, it's tough for Yates to go unnoticed. But back on the pitch, he slipped over to give Saracens the decisive try. Mind you, Ulster thought they levelled the match just before the end. Another move finished in the corner, but ruined by the video ref spotting a stray foot in touch. Try disallowed. Elsewhere, Bourguin basically ended Leinster's hopes in the competition. Alexandra Peclier's injury time penalty securing a two-point victory in their match. And in Wales, there were glimpses of the old Jonah Lomu on his home debut for Cardiff. No tries for him, but Cardiff strolled to a 43-16 win over Calvisano. And whatever he does, Lomu certainly draws a crowd. Joe Wilson, BBC News. There were also wins for Munster, Perpignan, Stade Francais and Biarritz. Ding Jing Wee became the first player from outside the British Isles to reach the final of the UK Snooker Championships. He beat Joe Perry this evening. The Chinese teenager won his semi-final 9-4, thanks largely to some wonderful potting. The 18-year-old will face Steve Davis in tomorrow's final, a player who is some 30 years his senior. The Australian cricketer Shane Warne has set a new world record. He's now taken 87 test wickets in a calendar year. The leg spinner passed Dennis Liddy's record of 85 when he dismissed South Africa's Ashwell Prince. He then added another wicket to take the record to 87. 40 of those came in the Ashes series against England, of course, this summer. And that's all the sport for me, Dan. Chris, thank you for that. Now, before we go, a reminder of our top story. Tony Blair's EU budget deal has been attacked by the main opposition parties who say he's won little in return for cuts in Britain's rebate. Well, that's it from us in the newsroom. So from Chris and from me, good night. Good evening. Well, if you've just got in, you may still be in the process of thawing out. It's a proper December night out there, isn't it? Bitterly cold. These are the sorts of values in the cities, but in rural spots, we're already as low as minus six or minus seven in some places. So a bitter start to the day, but some sunshine to look forward to first thing. This will be a fairly typical scene. Except that is across Western Scotland, Northern Ireland. Here it'll be cloudy and damp. A bit of sleet or snow across central and western parts of Scotland just for a time. And the risk of some of that rain falling onto frozen surfaces. So one or two icy stretches. But it'll be milder across Northern Ireland. Some of that cloud spilling into western parts of Wales and down across southwest England. But points east of that will be bright but very cold. This is the extent of the frost, even at 9 o'clock in the morning, still sub zero. But for East Anger in the southeast, we can look forward to some sunshine here. For the rest of us, though, a clouding up process from the west. And after that chilly start with the cloud coming over the top, it's going to feel quite raw out there. Some dampness arriving, some heavier bursts of rain for Northern Ireland and Scotland later on. But here, it will eventually turn quite mild, 8 or 9 degrees chilly, you'll notice, across East Anglia and the southeast. Now, overnight tomorrow, we'll all have a bit of a splash. Rain will track its way southeastwards. It won't hang about. It'll clear the south coast in the early hours. Under clear skies, we will see temperatures falling again, so the risk of one or two icy stretches on Monday morning. But by and large, the new working week looks pretty good. Plenty of dry and bright weather out there. The wind's coming in from the west, too, a milder source of air, so temperatures up to 7 to 9. Good night. sources are calling this our longest night. You will surrender or they will die. Tell them this planet is armed. We do not surrender. Look in the sky. There's a great big alien invasion and I don't know what to do. No sign of the doctor. Nothing yet. Doctor Who. Christmas Day at 7 on BBC One. Bridget Jones, wanton sex goddess with a very bad man between her thighs. Mum. You got a boyfriend? A real one? I hope he's good enough for our little Bridget. Absolutely not. Bridget Jones' Diary. Bye -bye. Christmas Eve at 9.40 on BBC One. You filming? Ready? 
go. Are you ready for Christmas? She says, no. Shall we mingle? And I said, stuff it. What? <laughs> you just love Christmas. I've got something for you. It's bigger than ever. Speak for yourself. Oh, you can't believe you just said that. Would you love it? <laughs> No. <laughs> I'm going to tell a joke about a fairy. I am the only one. On with the bunting and frolics. <laughs> it just gets better and better, doesn't it? Help yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Santa. <laughs> Next here on BBC One, Gary Lineker has highlights of the day's goals in the Premiership. Paul McCartney at the Abbey Road Studios on BBC Two performing a few numbers from his back catalogue and BBC News 24 is talking movies. Escape to Bark from 7 tomorrow morning on BBC Radio 3. Vic Chopra, private detective. He walks the glamorous beat of the private eye. You fancy it.